Does it never end with this guy? I'm talking about Rex Hureman, a.k.a. the prime suspect in the Long Island serial killer murders. Let me just give you an example. <clears throat> He's enjoying behind bars Italian sausage, green beans, whipped potatoes, seasoned veggies, and macaroni salad. Nobody's cooking that for me, but they are for him as he spends two to three hours a day combing over discovery provided by the state, including secret grand jury testimony. Oh, and did I mention his wife has just signed a $1 million deal with Peacock? <clears throat> Does it pay to be a serial killer? I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories and on Series XM 111. In the last weeks, Rex Hewerman in court. Now, guess who shows up for the first time and shows up, may I add, in style. Listen. When Asa Ellerup showed up for one of Hewerman's recent court appearances, she arrived in a silver Mercedes, was equipped with a lavalier microphone, and a Peacock documentary crew in tow. Ellerup was seen smiling in court as she was seated with her attorney, Bob Macedonia, and an interviewer from the documentary crew. Ellerup even smiled and nodded at Hewerman when he turned and smiled at her before leaving the courtroom. Okay, hold on. I, I think my, hear my hearing is it finally going. Because I thought I heard that she showed up in a silver Mercedes and smiled at the guy she hasn't visited one time. The guy who allegedly is torturing and murdering hook sex workers in their home. Um, Jackie, could you please play that again? I must have misheard it. When Asa Ellerup showed up for one of Hewerman's recent court appearances, she arrived in a silver Mercedes, was equipped with a lavalier microphone and a Peacock documentary crew in tow. Ellerup was seen smiling in court as she was seated with her attorney, Bob Macedonia, and an interviewer from the documentary crew. Ellerup even smiled and nodded at Hewerman when he turned and smiled at her before leaving the courtroom. Okay. I heard correctly. The wife who claimed that she was bankrupt... And I believe even started a GoFundMe to support herself. Is showing up in a silver Mercedes with a lavalier mic on and a camera crew all done up. Really? Okay. Is this Asa Ellerup or is this Kim Kardashian being or, or Megan and Harry? You remember every time they show up in New York, there's a camera crew chasing them around. Charlie Langston joining me, uh, U.S. editor for DailyMail.com. What? I mean, things have certainly taken a turn for Miss Ella up. Let us not forget that just a few weeks ago, she was seen looking, I mean, absolutely kind of out of things. She was disheveled. She was crying. And now all of a sudden, she's turning up at court, as you said, like an A-list superstar. She's accompanied by cameras. She's smiling. She was even seen laughing with the Peacock interviewer. And that is because her life has taken a pretty drastic turn in the last couple of weeks. Now, obviously, having your husband suspected of multiple murders is not that easy to deal with, but she's now got the cushion of a $1 million Peacock documentary deal, plus her husband recently signed over their $530,000 home to her for $0. So her life has really kind of taken, you know, as much as it can, a few positive steps forward. So I'm sorry, what, did you say a few... About. Positive steps, a million dollar deal, a camera crew chasing her around, and her husband signed over half a million dollar home to her. Uh, some would argue in a bid so the murder victims' families can't get at it. Okay, you know what? <clears throat> to Joseph Jacqueline, I, I think you'll be able to agree with me on this or at least empathize with what I'm about to say because you're a former NYPD sergeant author of the Cold Case Handbook, The Criminal Investigative Function, A Guide for New Investigators, uh, podcast host of a hit series, True Crime with the Sarge. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but my point is, you've been in the trenches, just like me. I've seen crime victims suffering, trying to deal with the loss of their mother, their daughter, and in such a horrible way, because you know, if these allegations are true, 
He, Rex Hewerman, murdered unarmed, defenseless women as he was raping them and beating them and binding them and torturing them and killing them. Many of them had children that to this day don't really know what happened to mommy, can't bear to think about her last moments being raped and tortured by Rex Hewerman. And now Asa Ellerup has a million dollar peacock deal and they're suddenly exchanging smiles and loving glances in court when she hasn't visited him one time until the camera showed up. I don't know, Joe Jacqueline, it just, I, I want good things for her, but the irony that nobody gives a flying fig about the crime victims' families that grew up without a mother, that doesn't bother you after all the crime victims you've seen? Absolutely. It's what's happening is absolutely ab uh, abysmal. I mean, it's bass ackwards. About, That's what it is. Bass ackwards. Yeah. We have gotten away from being victim centric in our society and it's always should have been that way. And it, sh it should continue to be that way. And we shouldn't be rewarding people. I don't care if it's family members or not for the deeds of their uh, loved ones. Let's put it that way. The issue that really comes down to is that these families have been struggling for decades and the problem is that they have just gotten some breaks, right? The new police administration, Rodney Harrison, comes in, takes charge. You know, some of the cases are being solved. And then, you know, unfortunately, he's leaving, and, and we see this now happening. And we have always seem to forget about the victims, and the victims should always be front and center. I mean, you don't even, even the media is not even interviewing them or, or reaching out to them and saying, hey, let me hear your story. It just has never happened in this case. And I know John is here. I mean, if it wasn't for uh, John Ray, this case would have been died in the media a long time ago. Oh, so, and speaking of issue... John Ray, you know what? That's another thing I like about you, Jacqueline. You're not a camera hog. You know, <laughs> you, you, you're calling out John Ray, who has gone so far in advancing this case. Uh, John Ray is with us. He's the family lawyer for Shannon Gilbert, who I believe was murdered by Rex Hewerman. And while the wife... John is uh, planning what she's going to do, do with that million dollars and, and the $500,000 house that's been signed over to her. You are out there finding witnesses that are absolutely linking two women, Shannon Gilbert and Karen Vergata, to Rex Hewerman. So where's the indictments? Hey, hey, John Ray, high-profile lawyer, joining us. You can find him at johnraylaw.net. John Listen to this from our friends at CrimeOnline.com. At least $1 million. That's how much Rex Huerman's family will reportedly be paid for taking part in an upcoming documentary for Peacock NBC. Asa Ellerup and her two grown children with the accused Long Island serial killer have agreed to sell their life rights, shadowing the family during Huerman's upcoming trial for the murders of three sex workers. One million dollars. Okay, John Ray, you have brought to light multiple eyewitnesses, and they're not all sex workers. And listen, John, I spent a lot of time as a felony prosecutor in strip bars and going up and down uh, the strip in uh, just outside inner city Atlanta, speaking to sex workers, um, trying to develop cases, all sorts of cases, drug cases, prostitution cases, child sex ring cases, you name it. Um, and the fact that many of these victims are sex workers, that means nothing to me, and I'm very distressed that anyone would place less value on their lives. They have daughters, sons, moms, dads, grandparents, that have never known what happened to them, and their pain is real. But I want to hear from you, John Ray, your reaction to a million-dollar peacock deal, reported million-dollar deal for Asa Elrup. Well, it, it, it's what I've been saying from the start. This Miss Elrup is a sociopath, and uh, she certainly is in the circle of suspects. 
But why would you call well. her associate? First of all, now I know you've got your JD and you're a high profile trial lawyer, but I don't believe you have your degree in psychology, right? Correct. Okay, hold on, hold on. Dr. Bethany Marshall joining me right now, psychoanalyst. Uh, you can find her at drbethanymarshall.com. She is in a brand new film project. Dr. Bethany, what is, now John Ray, maybe he's right. I don't mm -hmm. know, because I'm certainly not a shrink. What, did you say psychopath or sociopath, John? I said sociopath okay. what and is also that, suspect. Oh, you know, sociopath, yeah, sociopath and suspect. Wait a minute. Now, suspect okay. catches my attention a lot more than sociopath. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Bethany. Sociopath, what well, is sociopath that? Sociopath is somebody, somebody who has a, it's a disorder of detachment. They have a complete lack of uh, remorse. They're callous. They're cold. They're parasitic. They suck off of other they're people. They're what? Often. I'm sorry. Did you say they're, parasitic? They're parasites. Ah, parasitic. Okay, go ahead. They live off of other people. And... You know, often they use cruelty, um, which is interwoven with sexuality. So killing people at the same time as, you know, maybe having some kind of a masturbatory fantasy. But Nancy, if I could Can I ask, quickly, how do you work that, masturbation into every question I ask you? Because this is basically a sex crime. Serial okay. killing is all about sexual compulsivity. And could I weigh in about these wives really quickly? You know, you have an Asa Ellerup who is smiling. She has like a million reasons to smile right now. And she, she's pretty remorseless and callous towards the victims. And spouses of serial killers seem to fall into one of two categories. Either you have the Asa Ellerups, who really have a corruption of conscience along with the husband. We saw this with <clears throat> J.C. Dugard's um, captor. Remember hold the on, wife? Hold on, I need to write that down. Wife. Corruption of conscience. Okay, hold on. Go ahead. Now, many people would yeah. argue that she was, she is, was a battered woman. I don't know that to be true or not. I don't know if I could go so far as to call her a suspect. Um, guilty knowledge does not a suspect make. Did she aid and abet? That's a whole nother can of worms. Go ahead. Well, she doesn't appear to be um, an abuse victim right now. She seems to have kind of a superior smug attitude towards the victim. She's monetizing their death. So think of J.C. Dugard, who was kept in the captor's backyard. The captor and his wife would hold religious services, bring J.C. Dugard in, all, all the time that the husband was raping J.C. So the wife knew about it, she sanctioned it, she overlooked it, and compare that to the, the wife of the BTK killer. We've never heard much from her at all. She's ashamed, she was passive, she was firmly under his control. So on the one hand, you have the abused wife who pretty much knows nothing as in, and is in a state of shock. And then you have the wives who similarly feel that kind of that the victims have it coming to them and take some secret delight okay. in what's happening to the Speaking victims. of the wife as a potential suspect, who now has a million dollar deal with Peacock. Take a listen to our cut 238. The wife of Rex Huerman has not been accused of any wrongdoing by police. They've even gone so far as to say they believe she was out of town when the murders of the Gilgo Four were committed. However, in an interview with the U.S. Sun, attorney John Ray points out he doesn't see how it's possible to ignore or refuse to investigate Asa Ellerup in light of the purported evidence he has uncovered. Interesting to point out, hairs belonging to Ellerup were found on at least three of the women helping lead detectives back to Huerman. Hairs, is that right, Charlie Langston? Hairs found on three of the victims. And how many of those hairs do we believe belong to Asa Ellerup, the wife? That is correct. Multiple hairs were found on the victims that belonged to Hewerman's wife, Asa. And that was actually one of the things that linked him to the victims in the first place. So, you know, I think you can, you can say one of many different things. And I'm sure that there are some experts here who will be able to give you better informed information than I can. But how you can fail to investigate her completely seems absolutely wild to me. 
surely well, they would want to look into what she knew and whether she was connected to any of the victims. Because at the end of the day, she had physical evidence on their bodies that links her to three dead women. It's not just the hair, which we are understanding, and this will be made clear in court, that her hair is found on three of the victims. Um, take a listen now to our cut 228. The fourth comes from another state. She was a sex worker for many years. She said that she would service Rex Uriman over 20 times and that he, would, he was a serial user of sex workers. He would sometimes have them come two at a time to his house and his wife was home upstairs and in one instance got very angry at one of the sex workers because the wife believed that the worker had stolen an iron from, you know, for ironing clothes and had uh, had it in the car with the driver. So the driver had to get out, everybody had to search the car, there was no iron. But, but the, the wife knew about it and knew about, obviously, what was going on in order for that to happen. John Ray joining us, the lawyer for the family of Shannon Gilbert. And I'm still waiting on that indictment because now you have managed to dig up witnesses not necessarily in the sex business, that connect Hewerman, place Hewerman with Shannon Gilbert and Karen Fergata. What more do they need? I mean, do they really believe another serial killer came in and disposed of bodies where Rex Hewerman had been disposing of bodies? That doesn't even make any sense. It's astronomically unlikely that that happened and now eyewitnesses are linking them. So I explain your theory that Asa Ellerup is actually a suspect. Guilty knowledge does not a suspect make. Yeah, but she's more than guilty knowledge. First of all, I say suspect. I didn't say convict. <laughs> and, and and because she, 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 she has four hairs actually that turn up on the three bodies. One of those hairs turns up on the belt, the, the famous belt, uh, dealing with Brandon Barnes. And, uh, you know, to, for those hairs to get there uh, and all of them be on the different bodies all at once is, a, to me, a, a very strong case for, for her being a suspect. In, in it. It's not hair that just fell off of Rex. That's extremely unlikely. But, but in any event, we have that plus. We have this completely conscienceless, approach that she's had from day one when she got into this case. She is a, um, as I said, a sociopath about that, but she's also, uh, everything she says and does indicates that she is conscienceless. She has no conscience. That's a, that's a, a precondition as well. Does that, that puts her in the circle of suspects. There has to be more found out about her, but we have other witnesses who say, oh, she's having a, a you know, she's with her husband. They go and have their hair cut together. Uh, they travel together. This is not an abused woman. And yet uh, we have witnesses, eyewitnesses who put her in the room with her husband when these multiple sex uh, situations are going on in, the ha in this teeny weeny little house. So how does that tie in? Well, it puts her closer and closer to the center of the problem, which is the murders. And here she is, apparently also uh, involving herself in swinging as well, according to one of the witnesses. So uh, with her husband, that is. So we have here also something else about these two people, uh, she and her husband, and they are high risk takers. And you might wonder what happened to all their money. The guy made up $400 million over the course of years. Where did the money go? Uh, well, we now have a new witness who's come forward and says he spends his time sitting in certain gambling places uh, Mohegan, uh, Mohegan up in Connecticut, uh, he's there for hours and hours. He's a gambler. They are gamblers. They are risk takers. This woman has no conscience, so she can take the risks that she's taking. Think about this. Every time she talks to Peacock, whatever she says to them, eventually the, the district attorney is going to be able to subpoena records of what she said and, and, and why. Uh, all of that's on the table. And then she's got two lawyers who are getting paid to have her expose herself like this, it's, it's, it's bizarre. Well, another, uh, it's issue bizarre because about the whole what, case is bizarre. another issue about what you just said, John Ray, is the husband-wife marital privilege. Much of what prosecutors may want 
to ask Asa Ellerup uh, would be disallowed in court because Rex Hewerman, the defendant, would jump up, his lawyer would anyway, and claim marital privilege. The defendant is the one that claims the privilege, not the witness, not her. However, if she pierces the privilege by divulging to producers or anyone else, much less on camera, private conversations, private observations, she has relinquished the privilege. So I guarantee you there will be a court battle for not only the footage that they film, but everything Asa Ellerup says to producers, to assistants, to camera people, you name it. Anything that she says that could pierce the privilege. Could you boil that down? Yeah, I mean, basically what will happen is that everything she says, not, not only the Peacock, but to it, including her lawyers, that will lose the privilege when she's saying things to a third party uh, in front in the presence of her attorneys and with their consent, especially so. So they lose their privilege as well. That you know the attorney-client privilege disappears along with the disappearance of the the husband-wife privilege. There'll be no more privileges now that she's going into Peacock and doing this, and uh, it just makes. I mean, it's it's uh, completely antithetical to every reasonable position of innocence. It, it, it bespeaks over and over again of a reckless person who is certainly in this reckless situation with her, with her husband, and they're doing everything they can, both of them, to maximize the money while at, at the expense of the dead. That's what they're doing, and she's part of that. I want to circle back to the hair. Dr. Kendall Crowns is joining us, Chief Medical Examiner, Tarrant County, that's Fort Worth. Lecturer, University of Texas, Austin, and Texas Christian University Medical School. Dr. Crowns, thank you so much for being with us and, and taking time away from, oh my stars, I guess now over 10,000 autopsies you have performed. Could you explain, because I know this is going to be attacked in court, how hair is found, a, a third person's hair, not the victim's hair, on the victim's body, or for instance, in a burlap bag in which the victim's body is encased. How exactly is that done in a way that holds up under attack in court? So as I'm sure you're aware, everybody sheds a certain amount of hair every day and it gets on surfaces, on your clothes. No, no, in your no, car. no, no, I'm no. not aware. No. I don't know anything about shedding hair. Tell me. Okay, well, everybody every day loses a certain amount of hair. You, it's just a natural course of life. Everybody sheds a little bit of their hair as they go about the day, as you comb your hair, etc. So you have it on your clothes, you have it in your car, you have it on surfaces about your house. When someone gets murdered in an area where your hair fibers are at, their blood uh, can stick to that hair and it gets stuck to their body. Also, when the individual is being murdered, they may grab at your hair and pull it out of your head, and it gets on their body as well. If it's a third person, say his wife in this particular case, uh, her hair is in the house where these sex workers are at. Uh, her hair can be transferred onto them and then carried out. So hair is one of those fibers that can uh, easily get mixed onto a body just through the natural course of events. So we shed 50 to 100 hairs a day that we know of. And I also want to point out, John Ray, I hope you're sitting down, John Ray, high profile lawyer. The lawyers in this case are getting 400,000 and 200,000 respectively right. in court. That's a half a million dollars. That's a lot of money. Sure is. Okay. And, uh, go, go ahead, please. Yeah, no, I mean, the lawyers not only are getting paid, they're getting paid to do something that walks the very thin line of, of uh, you know, unethical, unethical behavior. In because what way? They're, putting their, they're exposing their client to, to possible uh, prosecution, and they're exposing their client at least to uh, assisting her, her in, in convicting her husband. You mean by so, allowing the Peacock documentary to go forward, if you could call it that, but... Allowing, yeah, and okay. to get paid for it by, <clears throat> by a third party. They're, getting, they're not getting paid by Ellerup. They're getting paid by a third party. 
So, so guys, who is their client? not only is there a million dollar deal and a silver Mercedes somehow has weaseled into this scenario, but there's also a GoFundMe. Take a listen to this. The daughter of the happy face killer, Keith Jesperson, set up a GoFundMe for Eller Up to help her do just that. So far, over $56,000 has been raised. Some victims' families have criticized the fundraiser. Sources tell news agencies that filming has already begun and will continue throughout the as-yet-unscheduled trial and its aftermath. Film crews were seen trailing the family to Hewerman's recent arraignment. Wow, and speaking of the recent arraignment, remember that... Ace Elrup has not been visiting her husband at all, zero times behind bars, until this. Listen. Asa Elrup, wife of suspected Long Island serial killer, shows up to visit him in jail, then comes to a hearing. Both the first since his arrest in July, and many wonder if she will continue to show up for her husband of 27 years. Elrup's divorce attorney confirmed that Elrup wants to see the court proceedings for herself. Rex Huerman is caught staring directly at his estranged wife in a recent court hearing. WPIX reports Huerman cast a sharp glance to his right, where Ellerup is sitting with her lawyer and a person from NBC Peacock. While Huerman is looking at her, Fox News reports Ellerup's expression is a slight smile in response. Exchange smile, exchanging smiles in the courtroom, a million-dollar deal in the works, a silver Mercedes driving her around. What? What's happening next? Plus a GoFundMe that is raising more money by the day while the husband, Rex Huerman, is behind bars being fed Italian sausage, green beans, whipped potatoes, seasoned veggies, and macaroni salad. Okay, joining me right now, special guest Keith Rovere, author of The Story of You, that's Why You, and podcast host of, and I didn't understand this at first, or now, the lighter side of serial killers. And you were sent Rex Huerman's letter by the smiley face killer. Is that correct, Keith Rovere? Uh, yes. For, thank you for having me on the show. The blessing to be a part of it. Um, I have known Keith for a few years now. Um, part of my First show of all, is, who is Keith? Keith Jesperson, the happy face killer. Um, he's been on my podcast probably 10 times or so. Um, and Rex isn't the first serial killer that he has written. Last I week assume I had a serial that killer. when you say Rex, mm -hmm. you are on a first-name basis with the two serial killers? Well, Rex Huerman, I have never talked to. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've never uh, corresponded with him at all. Uh, Keith had asked me for his address in prison, uh, or in jail, where, where is that now? So I sent him that. Um, Wayne Adam Ford, another serial killer just on my podcast, received a letter from Keith also years ago. Uh, author Shawcross, Charles Manson, he's written numerous people. Um, one of the reasons why he gave me the letter is like the Manson letter. The Charles Manson letter I received was stolen out of his cell. So he didn't want that letter stolen. So he sent it to me. You know, there's a trust factor built up. I've known him for many years. Um, the other reason he sent it to me, um, I was going to be on a Dateline special with this release on Rex Urban uh, last week. Um, they decided to cut this letter out. I didn't own the letter at that point. Uh, I just, they heard about the letter and they decided to not air that portion on the show. They want to focus more on the victims, rightfully so, came out great. Well, Keith found out about that, Keith Jesperson. And I told him, I'm not going to be part of the show. The letter's not going to be part of the show. They want to focus on the victims. That upset him. And so he said, I'm also going to send you this letter so you can show that one of the producers who wanted me on the show, I think Julie Kim is her name. Um, he was upset. He's like, oh, they think I'm lying because I lied to the press, you know, years ago. No, it's because you're a serial I, killer. That's but, why nobody yeah. believes them. <laughs> of course. Um, but that was the, one, a trust factor. He didn't want the letter stolen and show it to Dateline NBC saying, hey, look, I'm not a liar. Here's the letter. Here's the letter. Um, okay, just, I, I, I'm his, sorry. You know. Hold on. Don't care. And I don't mean that in an <laughs> evil, hateful way, but I don't care that a serial killer is angry that he didn't make Dateline. Just mm -hmm. could not care any less than I do. But speaking of the happy face killer who apparently has struck up a pen pal relationship with Rex Huerman. Do I have to quote my grandmother? Yes. Birds of a feather flock together. Okay, there, I said it. Take a listen to our cut 252. Who is the happy face killer? In the early 90s, Keith Jesperson was a long-haul truck driver who liked to kill women. 
when someone else took credit for one of his murders, he started sending letters to the media and police with information only the killer would know. He put a happy face on each of his letters and was dubbed the Happy Face Killer. In prison for life since 1995, the Happy Face Killer is becoming pen pals with suspected Long Island serial killer Rex Hewerman. The Daily Mail reports that Jesperson wrote a letter to Hewerman encouraging him to confess and offering some advice. Rex Hewerman reportedly writes back thanking the Happy Face Killer for the advice and then complains about the food in jail and the exercise yard. Um, Sydney, please get me some more menus from the jail because you know what? I'm making fish fillets tonight, the kind you get at frozen and they have a little breading on it because the twins love them. They think they're having fish, okay? So I, I, don't, I think I would do a backflip if somebody came in and had prepared, and I've got to hear more, Italian sausage, green beans, whipped potatoes, seasoned veggies, and macaroni salad. I'm sure that there's a dessert in there. And these two are complaining about the food behind bars? I mean, what are they talking about with each other, Keith? One thing I think is very telling, um, sometimes it's what's not in a letter or what somebody does not say in writing that. Like you how notice, they I get tortured, of, raped, and murdered unarmed and defenseless women once they lured them and got them alone and then overpowered them by girth and weapons? Yes, and also the fact what he did not say is, I did not do it. I am not guilty. I get, a, I get a sense of, like, peace about this, like, acceptance, like, yeah, they got me. I wonder what the food's going to be. Not, I didn't get a sense of any of that, that, hey, I'm not guilty. What do I do? What do I do? I, I definitely did not do this. Nothing. It's almost a calmness when you read that letter of, it just screams guilt to me just uh, by reading it. Hold on just a moment. You're absolutely right. Nowhere do they claim, I didn't do this. I'm being railroaded. Sydney, how dare you point out to me that you had already sent me that information. Okay, here we go. For breakfast, chilled grape juice, hot cinnamon oatmeal, toast, margarine, milk, coffee, sugar. Okay, hot wheat cereal, blah, 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 crispy rice cereal, hard-cooked eggs. That's just for breakfast. Wait for it. Is this lunch or dinner? Lunch. Beef cacciatore with spaghetti, steamed green beans, bread and butter, Hawaiian beverage, applesauce, and for the vegans, meatless pepper steak. Okay, I mean, here's one of my faves. This is for lunch, tomato soup, cream of tomato, and grilled cheese sandwich. It's like mother is cooking your meal. Barbecue chicken, white rice, Creole bean sauce. I mean, it goes on and on. Why is that irritating me so much, Joe Jackalone? Well, it actually shows you that we treat our prisoners a lot better than what uh, some of the activists uh, have been telling us for years. And it's just something that, um, I think it's something else. I'm not listening to the activists lying on the courthouse steps. <laughs> it's the fact that these guys, I mean, how hard is it, Dr. Bethany Marshall? You're the shrink. And I hated doing this to juries, but I did it, every murder trial. I made them think. Now, it's actually against the law constitutionally for them to put themselves in the shoes of the victim. That's disallowed in most jurisdictions. But I would force them to think about what the victims went through. Mm. Let's just think about this. And Dr. Bethany, Charlie Langston, Daily Mail, superstar, everybody on the panel jump in if I'm missing anything. A lady is lured to be alone with Rex Hewerman, who's like, what, 6'5", weighs about three, uh, at least a deuce and a quarter. 6'4", oh, and he weighs 280 pounds. That's less than I thought. So she's alone with him, and he begins to rape her vaginally and anally, and during that, torturing her and beating her until he strangles her dead. Some of the victims... Uh, of which I suspect him, dismembered. They never, what are their last thoughts as they're getting raped and they're passing out? Just imagine that moment that this is happening. Will they ever see their children again? Will they ever see their family again? Or is this it? And then they die. 
and this guy is getting cream and tomato soup and a grilled cheese sandwich. And Nancy, it's like, like he's being put in the center of mother's care. Um, back to the earliest part of life where everything is provided for him. He doesn't have to work anymore. He doesn't have to earn what he gets. He's sort of at the center of things. Everything is brought to him. In some ways, it's like the ultimate example of being catered to. Now, you and I may not want to be catered to that way, but for someone like him, he is at the center of things. And think of this. He and this other, the, hap the, the smiley face killer, they're giving advice. They're, they're passing little notes back and forth. like And bragging the about their pen pal relationship. Charlie Langston, isn't it true that Huerman was arrested at the moment he was arrested because police believed he was about to strike again? Uh, a woman reportedly called police because he was following her in a park and she got so freaked out she left the park. She was there for a walk, maybe with her dog. And he was following her around, and he had just recently bought more minutes for a burner phone, which was his mode of reaching and luring his victims. He was about to strike again. There were definitely suspicions that he was going to commit more crimes. And I think that's what forced the, the investigators to kind of take the step of arresting him when they did. But the, the reality is, when you look at the letters that were exchanged between Jesperson and Hewerman, as everyone has said, there's a sense of acceptance coming from Hewerman here. He's asking Jesperson whether he's going to get butter for his bread in prison, as though he's thinking about what life is going to be like when he gets to prison. Jesperson has encouraged him to confess, telling him that he should avoid the media circus that would surround a trial, and also advising him that his life in prison will be easier if he just pleads guilty, avoids the media circus, because that way other people in prison will know less about his crime. He even said, you know, you should avoid giving the prosecutors the opportunity to gloat about the evidence that they have found against you. And, you know, if anyone's going to know whether or not a person is a serial killer, it's another serial killer. You said it, birds of a feather flock together, but it also takes one to know one. And I think that looking at Jesperson's correspondence with Hewerman is incredibly telling. I'm still wondering where the indictments are for the two additional women, Vergata and Gilbert. How much longer do their families have to wait for justice? And uh, speaking of the letters, Keith Rovere with us, author of The Story of You, That's Why You, and star of a hit podcast, The Lighter Side of Serial Killers. Keith Rovere, you do know that Rex Hewerman was writing The Happy Face Killer and asking if Happy Face got butter on his toast. That's what he's worried about. He's not worried mm -hmm. about the dead victim's families or what their children are going through growing up without their mother, wondering what happened to her. He's worried about not getting butter on his toast. I think he's incapable of that. I mean, certainly, um, I'm not a psychiatrist, but let's just assume um, he's a psychopath who lacks empathy. Like Keith Jesperson did almost 10 episodes on my show going into detail about his crimes with so lack of interest and empathy, joking about everything. I don't think it's possible for him. Do he, can he talk about it? Certainly. Does he care? No. He doesn't have, his brain doesn't give him the ability to care or to have empathy. Um, I mean, that's part of what I do, what I do, to learn more about them. It wasn't that long ago we thought people with schizophrenia were demon-possessed. So I do what I do to learn more about that. How does a brain work? Why don't they have the ability to have fear? That's another thing we can kind of read in a letter. There's no fear in that letter. There's no fear. I mean, psychopaths aren't deterred by fear. Um, certainly those with a degree can tell a lot more than I can. But if you're not deterred by fear, you have no empathy, usually that amygdala portion of the brain of frontal cortex when it's not working right, you're also not an ability to stop. Like if someone bumps you on the shoulder, you want to smack them, oh, I better not, it's a bad idea. They don't have the ability because your brain doesn't function that way. So no, there's no fear, there's no lack of empathy. That's the last thing on his mind because it's incapable of feeling that way. So it wouldn't However, be in the letter. It, uh, I'll jump in, oh, Dr. Bethany. So sorry. However, the lack of empathy is not because they don't know what other people are thinking and, and how other people feel, they know. Correct. They just don't care. 
They can't feel it. Exactly. They can fake it. They can't feel it, but they know. They can describe it. So, Charlie Langston, as we are somehow getting sucked into whether Rex Hewerman can relate to what he did to his victims, according to police, Charlie, I don't understand what the holdup is. Now, it was a couple of months ago we were told that DNA from a Vegas murder victim is being compared to find out if she is another of Rex Hewerman's victims. We know there is a woman in South Carolina that was placed with Hewerman just before she goes missing. When are we going to see results? I mean, I think the issue here is that, you know, it took... 13 years for anything to actually be done after the remains of more than 10 people were discovered in Gilgo Beach. So 13 years, I mean, you know, people who have better understanding of criminal law will be able to tell you more, but 13 years is an incredibly long time for people to be dragging their feet. And that is not for lack of prompting from lawyers, from family members. You know, we were talking earlier um, about Shannon Gilbert. You know, her mother, up until the end of her life, was begging investigators to, to keep looking into her daughter's disappearance and death. And it was actually the discovery of her remains that prompted the investigation into Rex Hewerman in the first place. But when you look at how long it's taken for any action to really be taken on the part of investigators, I think it's tragic that nothing else has been done. I think it's devastating that, you know, kind of multiple other bodies, multiple other victims are having their crimes go unsolved. But it doesn't surprise me, unfortunately, because when you look at this case on the whole, it has taken investigators so long to try and achieve any form of justice. And is it surprising that Hewerman was tempted to commit another crime when he went over a decade without anyone holding him under a microscope and looking at him as a suspect. Right now, we are waiting as Asa Ellera rakes in money and is being driven around in a silver Mercedes. We wait to find out, will there be other charges as it relates to the Long Island serial killer suspect, Rex Hewerman? Goodbye, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.